Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth uh, symposium of the uh, 30th anniversary academic sessions of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. This symposium is For Breath is Life, Exposing the Silent Killer. There will be three important speech, uh, speeches scheduled for this symposium. Our first speaker is Professor Paul uh, T.J. Seepers. He is the Associate Professor and Principal Lecturer of the Radboud University, Netherlands. He's, the, he's an European Registered Toxicologist and Occupational Hygienist. He will be talking about indoor and outdoor air pollution. Professor Sheepers, for you now. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, good afternoon. Um, I, uh, I'm happy to contribute to this session um, with my talk on air pollution. I will focus on outdoor air pollution and I will approach this uh, topic from uh, epidemiology and then also discuss the uh, toxicity mechanisms. And at the end of my talk, I will address some of the potential solutions. Um, but maybe first, let's say, let, I would like to take you to the history of air pollution. And in Europe, I think uh, the London smog episode in, of 1952 was a, a very interesting um, event that showed actually that uh, at that time, the uh, air quality had a large impact on mortality. Uh, and I'm now I'm talking about acute mortality. So in a couple of days during the, uh, let's say, ep episode, um, there was a, a considerable uh, increase in mortality that was on hindsight, let's say the result most probably of both uh, particles and also sulfur dioxide, uh, the substance that um, can be produced when using uh, coal for heating, for home heating. And interestingly, let's say in more recent times, and I'm now showing the let's say, situation uh, in Beijing uh, uh, about 10 years ago, that uh, also, uh, let's say in those uh, episodes, like shown here in, in two months during the summer, we see also similar uh, high levels of, um, of air pollution. And there is also indication that uh, specifically children and elderly are suffering uh, and that will also lead to acute mortality. And actually this was, uh, this triggered, this type of data triggered um, researchers in the US in, um, in, the nine, in the 1990s to study the relationship between levels of air, of, of particulate air pollution and mortality. And I think that the method methodology of time series analysis was, I think, crucial to dis disentangle, uh, let's say, mortality patterns and also temperature patterns that also have, uh, let's say, are interrelated due to, let's say, cardiovascular disease. Uh, but it, this resulted in a very clear association with uh, air quality and specifically PM levels in, in air, outdoor air. And that resulted in follow-up studies uh, in Europe and also in other continents that uh, basically reconfirmed the situation. That's a very nice overview, let's say, of the impact of these, uh, um, of these PM uh, air pollution levels. Uh, I, will, I will talk now about PM10 and black smoke. And PM10 uh, is, is, let's say, the coarse fraction. Uh, more recently, we are now going to look at more finer, let's say, fractions, PM2.5, ultrafine particles. But uh, let's say this was one of the first studies to uh, trying to uh, meet analyze um, several uh, time series studies and show the percentage percent changes per uh, level of exposure. And uh, let's say at the top of this table, you see the uh, impact on mortality. So that's acute mortality related to 
the contribution of air pollution, both PM10 and uh, black smoke. You see that for all ages, there is definitely um, uh, an, an increase um, per 10, per, per let's say increase of 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And there is also, as, uh, let's say a concern regarding hospital admission. And there we see um, that uh, spe specifically, let's say patients with susceptibility to respiratory disease, uh, let's say elderly would be, let's say uh, at risk, but also, and that's a very important uh, indication that uh, in the case of black smoke, we see a clear uh, a significant increase for asthma in uh, children um, of uh, age below 14. And that I think triggered quite a, a bit of research. I would like, I would first like to just indicate that recently there have been several publications um, like this one by the Lancet Commission on, Air, on Pollution and Health that indicate clearly that the pattern, let's say, that was suggested in the previous slide is confirmed and also includes uh, concern that uh, actually during, let's say, early development there is an increased risk uh, for children in early age. And also we confirmed that there is definitely uh, um, say a pattern that shows that uh, air pollution is also affecting um, old age. And that air in that sense, let's say, um, is, is a very important, uh, uh, let's say that air pollution is a very important concern as compared to other environmental pollution. Uh, and this is not only related to mortality, but uh, even let's say uh, it's also a clear pattern um, with uh, disability adjusted life years, as you can see here. So that basically confirms our concern that specifically susceptible subgroups in the population are affected by, uh, by both, uh, in this case, um, uh, air and soil pollution. Uh, this, what it looks like, let's say, in a geographical setting, I think this heat map shows where the problems are. Uh, and um, let's say I have some more data to um, express a concern that, let's say, actually, this is a definitely a global uh, problem, but also a problem related to uh, low low income countries. And that this is, uh, at the moment, let's say until uh, 2015, at least, according to the Lancet report, an increasing problem. Uh, and uh, let's say attributing to different uh, outcomes. Um, this is, I think, uh, one of the uh, graphs in the, the Lancet paper that shows uh, that's a little bit about the uh, patterns in different uh, um, regions and also shows what I've added to this uh, figure is the most recent um, air quality guidance that was uh, published uh, a month ago uh, and that indicated uh, let's say that we should be uh, 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 let's say going to a much stricter guidance for air pollution um, if you go to the website, you will see that you can uh, uh, upload uh, um, a report that uh, proposes a gradual, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, further uh, restriction of, of uh, PM 2.5 in uh, outer air um, to levels that uh, correspond to uh, an annual um, uh, um, average of uh, uh, five and a day average of uh, 15 micrograms per cubic meter. So let's say from this graph, you can clearly see the gap, let's say between where some countries are uh, now and where they should be aiming for. Um, and that I see, think is also very clearly expressed in this slide where the WHO tries to uh, share their concern regarding the overall risk of, of environmental exposure. And moreover, let's say the very clear 
say a pattern that uh, let's say more recently in 2019, 99% um, of the population is not protected um, regarding the risk of uh, air pollution, that we are looking worldwide at um, a very high rate of uh, mortality uh, based on the numbers uh, from 2016. And that a considerable part, let's say more than 90% of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Um, and that, let's say, we, of course, there are technically uh, speaking, there are, are the solutions to this, but uh, yeah, it's, I think, a matter of informing policymakers and the public um, that um, we should, um, let's say, change our lifestyles, we should change uh, our city planning uh, to be able to um, reduce this uh, health impact. Um, and now I would like to um, show you why I think from toxicology perspective, we are learning um, about the potential health risk of uh, particles. And I would like to start to show you that um, in the outdoor air setting, uh, we are looking at, uh, uh, let's say, three, uh, three um, types of uh, particles that are, can be distinguished in this three modal, uh, let's say, distribution uh, by looking at uh, from left to right to the nucleation mode, which is the submicron particles that tend to, let's say, have a, have a have a restricted lifespan um, and, uh, and will um, age and reach um, the uh, higher, um, let's say, um, size in the accumulation mode. But that those are still particles that can definitely penetrate deeply into our system. And then uh, there is also to the right course mode. Those are the particles that in part are uh, uh, also, um, let's say, inhaled as a result of so the sedimentation or suspension. Whereas, the, let's say, the diffusion and the impaction mode uh, are li more likely to, let's say, be airborne uh, most of the time. And uh, let's say this is, let's say, how uh, the environmental uh, exposure uh, presents itself. And now I would like to. Uh, go to a definition, definitions of particle size and uh, penetration in our airways. For that, we have um, a fairly complex uh, definition that is based on what we know about penetration of, of, of our particles in the airways. And we have technical uh, definitions uh, related to the particle size. I should mention that uh, actually uh, in, let's say, in, in, in communications often we just assume that PM10 are particles smaller than 10 micron and PM2.5 are uh, indicated as particles smaller than 2.5 micron, but that's in part, let's say, not, not correct because actually what I should show you below is that our airways um, uh, don't have this cutoff, let's say at 10 or 2.5. Uh, we should be looking at the respirable fraction and the inhalable fraction. Actually, let's say the 2.5 particles are, uh, are respirable particles that uh, can uh, reach the unciliated parts of the lungs that uh, and result in a long-term um, um, retention. Whereas the PM10 particles can uh, pass through uh, below the thorax and uh, are also relevant let's say, in terms of, of, uh, of lung dose. Uh, and this all relates to the uh, complexity of, of how um, particles behave in the airways. And uh, the airways basically have uh, quite a number of uh, of, uh, of defenses, uh, first of all, about the structure of the airways, because um, the uh, particles that cannot, let's say, follow the airflow will um, at some point um, be impacted, let's say, on the um, 
on the air lining, in the air lining, in the lung lining fluids. Uh, and if that happens in the upper airways, um, this will lead to uh, uh, um, the removal of these particles by the, by the mucus that is slowly uh, moving uh, upwards. Whereas, uh, let's say, the smaller fractions, and that's actually shown, shown in, the, in the picture here below, um, uh, tend to reach, let's say, those part of the, of the airways that don't, do not have these uh, ciliated airways, and that uh, results in retention of these particles uh, of, so, uh, let's say, over a longer period of, of, of time, 50 to maybe up to several hundred days. And uh, as recently uh, discovered, we also know that these particles will, will be able to enter the circulation. That's a very interesting finding, and I will come back to that uh, later. But first, let's have a look at uh, how these particles behave in the, in the lungs. And this is, I think, uh, the picture on the, on the left shows, uh, let's say, a very useful picture to show that uh, talking about penetration, that's one, but talking about the position, that's, of course, the more relevant um, indicator to um, try to understand the fate of particles in the human body. And here we see actually the, the pattern of deposition, which is, as this picture shows, um, it, let's say, a different uh, in each uh, level of, uh, of, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the airways, uh, and definitely shows that the pulmonary L, uh, LVO, alveoli, let's say, is, is an area where we expect, let's say, some of the smaller particles, finer particle fraction to be deposited. And from there, I think, um, yeah, going back to uh, epidemiology, we know that um, the effects of uh, the PM2.5 particles um, in the long-term uh, mortality uh, uh, risk setting does not show a uh, threshold. And that is a really important concern that is supported by in this case. I show you the results of uh, of an uh, of an uh, uh, systematic review uh, where data pulled from from uh, forty plus uh, cohort studies that shows that uh, yeah why actually we see that the WHO is is supporting a further uh, let's say reduction of the air quality gui guidance because of the lack of this threshold. That's also the interesting for toxicology. Uh, and uh, I'll try to explain that over the past 20 years, uh, we have been able to identify different mechanisms. And this picture um, is, is from a, a, a very good review paper by Donaldson, where he tries to make the point that actually the uh, inflammatory, inflammatory mechanisms um, that uh, we find in different populations indicate that we are looking at the same thing, let's say, for to explain toxicity by uh, ultrafine particles and also nanoparticles, we're looking at the same mechanism involving uh, both oxidative stress and inflammation. And that, uh, let's say, uh, with this. Uh, mechanism of toxicity we can explain um, effects on airways but also effects on the uh, circulation and cardiovascular system and that was very well described in a, in a paper by Mills uh, a group uh, that did also very interesting human volunteer studies uh, that supported the notion that um, these particles when let's say in the ultrafine mode when entering the circulation, the blood circulation, they will find targets in different parts of the circulation uh, that uh, explain um, the mortality uh, and morbidity that we see for patients with a um, cardiovascular uh, predisposition. Um, and also explain, let's say, why we see stroke and why we see uh, cere uh, uh, cerebral damage, let's say, that contribute to explain also mortality seen in, uh, in epidemi epidemiology studies. I would now like to go from uh, 
the research to uh, the field of how to com communicate to um, policymakers and to the public about this problem. I think a very, uh, let's say, way to do that is to show some visual uh, let's say images that indicate where the problems are. And I think this is an, an just an example mapping of, uh, of a gas phase component uh, and NOx that's also related to combustion sources like diesel exhaust and uh, combustion of uh, solid fuels and gas, where we actually see that um, it's a worldwide problem and there are different, def definitely hot spots. And uh, I think it's for Netherlands, for example, it was good to know that uh, Netherlands is a hotspot for NOx. Uh, and I will show you some further pictures that support that. In Europe, it was definitely also um, good to see how um, the um, expected loss in life expectancy is distributed amongst uh, European countries. That's a traditional idea is, of course, that in Central uh, Europe, you have uh, heavy industry that contributes, especially the use of coal um, uh, may uh, contribute as well as the, let's say, house uh, warming by coal may, may contribute to uh, poor air quality. But uh, it's a bit, let's say, of course, shocking when you see that some countries that uh, have, um, let's say, that use coal, but have good, um, let's say filters on, on, on the stacks of those uh, power plants also have a problem with uh, air pollution and uh, the health impact. And I will show you uh, the reason. Well, the reason is, is so clearly in this picture uh, that's, um, uh, let's say, um, to trying to, to um, zoom in, let's say, on city on a city map where you see on the, on the top uh, right, you see the, the, bar, the, the PM, let's say, um, heat map. Um, and on the, on the, on the right uh, uh, bottom, bottom, you see the NOx pattern. That's clearly related to uh, traffic as a source of air pollution. So not so much industrial activity, but mostly traffic is, let's say, the reason why we have to be concerned uh, in Europe. And this, I think, and now I come to uh, to the uh, topic of how to communicate this to the to the wider public. Um, there are some examples of very good, let's uh, um, say, websites where you can uh, look at, let's um, say, what city um, council can do uh, to improve the overall quality in in the city. Um, this is a nice example where you see uh, that the traffic, um, let's say, is a source of uh, of air pollution. Uh, in this case, uh, PM10 uh, related to main, let's say, roads of traffic. And uh, at the bottom of this slide, you see a slider where you can uh, travel, let's say, through time. In the next picture, you see that, let's say, policy intervention. Um, uh, let's say, have resulted in a decrease of air pollutants. And this is important to the public because they also have a role uh, because they are also part of, let's say, uh, the community that is uh, that should understand why traffic measures are needed, should understand that, let's say, if they take the bike instead of a, of a, of a car in the city center will contribute to reduction of, of this exposure. Uh, I would like to touch upon briefly um, also city pla planning in terms of structure of the, let's say, road pattern. This is an example that I, I used to show my students in, in Nijmegen, where I, I teach at the university. On the left side, uh, you see the traditional, let's say, star pattern of a city center. Nijmegen, had, let's say, was, uh, was, was based by the Roman culture and maybe it's in part, let's say, due to the, uh, let's say, city planning uh, at the early, let's say, development of the city that we have this star pattern with this very big uh, square in the city center. Where you see that big, big roads all lead to the to the city center, and on the right side you can see how another old city, the Bos, is also with a long history, 
uh, has, let's say, taken some drastic measures um, to um, have, um, let's say, the, the traffic uh, moving around the city rather than through the city. Also, they provide the buses, let's say, that you can take if you want to uh, want to take the car to the city's, uh, let's say, uh, perimeter. Would like to go into the city center, you can take a free ride on the bus and that will uh, reduce uh, the uh, traffic in the city center. And then I would like to also show some examples from, from the Netherlands where, uh, let's say, an app was, uh, was launched to um, have more, let's say, transparent information um, communicated with the public where also clearly, let's say, is, is shown as in this picture, on the left side, you see the ozone situation. Um, that is, I think, informative regarding, let's say, some specific, specific hotspots. Um, but at the right uh, side, you see clearly, uh, that, that, let's say, if you look at nitrogen oxides, that you see a clear pattern of the busy roads of the, of the, of the highways which is, let's say, education, educating the people about what they can do themselves to reduce air pollution. And more recently, this is an example from, from uh, recent research where also for ultrafine particles, software was developed to also indicate, say, how ultrafine particles are related to, you see a similar pattern that shows that certain uh, cities like Amsterdam uh, the, the Hague and Rotterdam and the whole industrial area, let's say in the harbor area and, and related to, let's say, this industrial area is um, is uh, a hotspot for all the fines, as well as the, the, the um, traffic, let's say, on, on highways. So to finalize this uh, overview, I would like to just uh, go over the most important to take homes. I think that uh, PM is still rated at, at the top five of global burden of disease. Um, so definitely a, a concern. Uh, from toxicology and epidemiology, we learned that especially primary particles from combustion um, can penetrate deeply into the airways and have an overall long lifespan, also can enter the blood circulation. And uh, that clearly explains, uh, let's say, what epidemiolo epidemiologists see uh, from the, on the population level that we can actually uh, support, let's say, the causal relationship between uh, air, particulate air pollution and, and what we see in terms of health impacts. Uh, that this is actually, let's say, just confirming that for particle toxicology, we are looking at a very similar mechanism uh, uh, that is explained by both inflammation and oxidative stress. And that, uh, well, what we learned from epi studies that there's no threshold, and that means that we clearly have uh, an important, uh, let's say, task to keep on reducing um, um, particulate air pollution, and that we should involve the public um, also to explain what they can do themselves and that they also should, of course, be very critical to, uh, let's say, the uh, community and the, and the county council, city councils regarding, let's say, what uh, citizens together with policymakers can, um, can change regarding the uh, air quality. And I, well, this, I think that we, I, uh, at the moment we have the Glasgow uh, conference. Uh, I think that, uh, let's say, most of the of the measures that we can take to improve air quality will also go in parallel with ambitions uh, to stop uh, climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Steve, for your very informative lecture. Uh, we'll entertain some questions at the end of the symposium. Now we'll move into the next lecture. The lecture, uh, is Dr. Tanya Vannakulasuriya. She is the senior lecturer of the Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. Her main uh, research area and all postgraduate studies are related to environmental physiology and occupational health. She will be talking about systemic effects of exposure to air pollution, BTS in focus. Over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Madam.
Now, when you gaze into the background of this slide, I do not think I can bid you a good evening or good afternoon. We are living in midst of this uh, toxic elements being uh, released into the air through industry as well as through household pollution. And it is both indoor and it, uh, outdoor as uh, Professor Sheep has uh, uh, explained very, very well earlier. And uh, amidst this, uh, we thought uh, by the Department of Physiology that we should explore how the uh, health has changed or how the systems in our body changes when we are exposed to this uh, amount of toxins. So I can still remember the day that uh, Professor Niranga popped into my room and said, I cannot bear the um, smells and the toxic fumes coming when I pump my fuel. So let us explore what's happening with the people who are exposed to this on a continuous basis and especially occupationally. And that's where we started and this is where we are today. And basically what I will be talking about is what we found out. And this is something very close to my heart as well, because I do travel for research and for presenting uh, scientific work. And uh, most of my travels, I try to take my young family with me. And two of the occasions were to some major cities in the world where I could not take my oldest child because of air pollution in China, as well as in New Delhi. And I lost some time to spend with her. So this is homage to her as well. So globally, uh, there are about 7 million deaths from air pollution. And of that, majority are from cardiovascular diseases. And uh, surprisingly, uh, the others take second stage due to pneumonia and other respiratory diseases. Strokes and uh, central nervous system eff effects uh, becoming prominent than respiratory systems was surprising for me. And it is called a silent killer because you breathe the air. And actually, I will tell you um, subsequently in the slides, even this air is not toxin free. It doesn't have to be the London smog of 1952 to kill you. This could kill you. So it is called the silent killer. And that's why we thought uh, it is our responsibility as the Department of Physiology who looked into this uh, to educate everyone on how to prevent it and that there is an effect and um, everybody should be responsible for their actions. So you will see, uh, even in uh, Professor Sheepa's slides, uh, you saw that Sri Lanka sits right smack in the middle of the most polluted area. And it is basically in the global south. So the poorer are the people who are affected the most. And this leads to not only um, changes in health, in changes in development, changes in cognition. So they will tend to be poor economically in the long run as well, because development also is affected uh, by air pollution. So is it only outside when you are walking in those toxic fumes of factories that you get exposed to? Of course not. It is also at home and especially in Sri Lanka and in the Asian context because of biomass for combustion in uh, cooking. So I, when we go to the chest hospital, the National Chest Hospital in Barisar, you see a lot of females with restrictive lung disease with the risk factor being biomass for combustion. And among them was once a, a lady who was very close to me as well. And she passed away prematurely because of her restrictive lung disease. So this was a topic which is very close to my heart and it should be close to yours as well. So it is not just the occupational exposure through paint or uh, working in a full pumping facility that you get exposed to. You can be doing some uh, aerosol spraying at home, maybe to kill some insects. So that would let you be exposed as well. So this is the volatile organic compound uh, distribution globally. And we are somewhere close to the red zones. And uh, Prof Schiefer's, uh was talking a lot about particulate matter. And when we uh, were discussing the initial planning stage of our research, we saw that uh, even Sri Lanka had somewhat done a little bit of research on air pollution and particulate matter. And VOCs were not touched upon at all or barely scratching the surface. So we thought that we should fill the gap of knowledge and do um, an exploration on what's happening with VOC exposure. So volatile organic compound exposure can be natural as well. So it comes from plants and soils and things like that as well. 
But there is more being uh, exposed to through um, fuel combustion during uh, commute uh, from vehicles, and of course, exposure to fuel in um, fuel handling facilities. Then there are the other minor exposures of uh, solvents as well, and paints and things like that. So what we wanted to identify was where does this exposure happen mostly? And of course, uh, Prof Niranga's suggestion just sprang up, let's do the fuel handlers per se. So we chose 50 fuel handlers from seven uh, fuel stations spread across the uh, Kampaha uh, district in Sri Lanka. And then we match an aged and sex matched population who were not occupationally exposed uh, to any of the uh, hydrocarbons and VOCs. Then we measured their exposure, and that is where uh, we were able to collaborate with Professor Sheepers uh, in the Radboud Medical College in uh, Netherlands, as well as KU Leuven in Belgium. Uh, the team from Radboud uh, came here and uh, did exposure evaluation. They would go and set up their uh, facility at a first station. They would record the people um, moving about within the facility, then exposures that happen through skin will be recorded. And they were also given a personal exposure monitor, which is what the person in yellow, the yellow t-shirt is um, wearing. Then the N exhaled uh, air was captured and was analyzed for, uh, especially for the three most important components, benzene, toluene, and silene. And then we correlated these with the health findings that we got. And we made sure that all the facilities in the Department of Physiology was utilized to the maximum. So all the laboratories got together, had their uh, protocols, and we uh, investigated the fuel handlers as well as their matched controls to see what was happening uh, when they are exposed to volatile organic compounds. And this uh, data was published uh, uh, by Professor Schiefers and his team on the exposure. So the exposure was significantly higher among those uh, being employed as gas station attendants. So the pre-shift values was, were measured before they started their shift after a 48 hour break. And they still continue to have one to three fold increase in the exposure values of BTX, benzene, toluene, and silane. The post shifts values are significantly high, about two to five four. So obviously they were getting exposed via occupation. And here you will be able to see in this uh, image, we assessed three instances where they were being exposed. First, where you and I also be, uh, would have the risk of being exposed to when we are pump pumping individual vehicles then measuring and estimating the amount of fuel within the tanks, and then uh, refueling the tanks. And as you will be able to see, the occupational exposure is significantly higher compared to what you and I would be exposed to. And in these graphs, you'll be able to see that the uh, smokers, the level of exposure to VTX was significantly higher. So through smoking also, that increases the uh, BTX exposure. Obviously, this exposure sh should or would lead to some derangement of health. And this is the gamut of uh, systemic illnesses, which are highlighted by research before. So we looked at six domains which were available uh, for us to assess at the Department of Physiology. But first of all, we needed to identify whether the uh, study participants and the controls were comparable to each other. And through their biometrics, we found that they were. So first, we'll look, take a look at the respiratory system. And these data have been published at the uh, Ceylon College of Physicians uh, in 2019. We did spirometry on the study participants as well as the controls, and we assessed the FVC, the vital capacity, FEV1, which is the blowing out of air within the first second, which shows whether there is obstructive disease, 
peak expiratory flow rate, which also shows uh, obstructive lung disease, and FEF 2575, which also gives an indication to small airway obstruction. And we found that peak expiratory flow rate was significantly lower among gas station attendants. And smokers, be it a control, had a lower value of lung functions via spirometry, and gas station attendants also, when they are smoked, their lung function parameters were much less. So smoking had an additive effect on uh, reduc reduction of uh, spirometry parameters. Then we looked at how long they've been working and with the prolonged uh, occupational exposure, their lung functions deteriorated. And of course, age would have had an effect on this as well. So the younger population wouldn't have had this five-year exposure as compared to those older. Then we made a correlation matrix with the exposure values and the lung function parameters. And you will be able to see that there is a clear pattern of red. And what does that indicate? That indicates a negative correlation. So higher the exposure, lower the lung function parameters. So the redder it is, the worse it gets. So the percentage predicted FEC was significantly lower among um, those exposed to high levels of toluene and silene as well as we've measured the delta values from pre-shift to post-shift exposure. And the last three dots here shows these delta values showing a significant reduction in lung function parameters, especially the percentage predicted FVC, which would ultimately lead to restriction. That was expected. And that was fine. Well, not fine, but that was expected. And that was a risk that they knew that the occupationally employed persons were aware of it. But the controls were not occupationally exposed to any of the BTX compounds. We made sure of that through exclusion criteria. But then we, in the exposure evaluation also, we saw that the exposure levels were much less. But we find that the lung functions correlate and the minute amount of uh, VOCs that they're exposed to or the BTX that they're exposed to reduces the lung function significantly. And it was more emphasized, which was alarming. So these workers were either working at the university, at the hospital, um, or in an office within the vicinity of the Raga Memorial area. So we all are being exposed to this and our lung functions are deteriorating little by little. But I have to tell you, there are a few limitations because we focused on BTX. We did not uh, evaluate the other uh, air pollutants that must be there. So th that is a limitation that we do identify. But that was something that we wanted to focus on and not just scratch the surface on. So it was intentional in a way. Then we assess the cardiovascular system. So uh, the Department of Physiology currently has one of the best uh, autonomic function laboratories in Sri Lanka, and that assesses the cardiovascular autonomics. And the cardiovascular component was done through that via ECG, and um, um, we assessed uh, the assisting parameters of blood pressure and heart rate as well. And this was done with autonomic functions, checking the central nervous system. We found that the well handlers had a significantly higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And it was, of course, as expected, correlated with their uh, body mass index. And in the nervous system, we also uh, did the full gamut of cardiovascular autonomic function testing, which was uh, an um, adaptation from the EWIGS criteria or EWIGS protocol. So hypertension was uh, one of the key features, um, a more percentage of persons were hypertensive among gas station attendants. And that would have also led to an abnormal uh, in, uh, reduction in the pressure response in hand grip testing. It is one of the methods by which we uh, test the sympathetic control of the autonomic nervous system. Then there was uh, other parameters which were higher, but not to a significant level. That could have been expected as well, but when we looked at the heart rate variability, which is a measure of autonomic function balance, we saw that the full handler's heart rate variability was altered as well. And the correlation showed that the delta benzene values and the delta toluene values negatively correlated with the heart rate variability parameters. And cognitive functions was assessed via MOCA test, uh, which 
uh, is very popular and very famous due to its political affiliations, we didn't see a significant risk of uh, mild cognitive impairment when we tested through uh, the uh, poor handlers through the MOCA test, but they scored less and the percentage of persons with mild cognitive impairment was higher among gas station attendants. Then we did, uh, they were fasting when they came to the Department of Physiology and we did, did a lot of uh, metabolic and endocrine testing on them. And after the blood was taken, they were given a standardized meal before our other protocols. And we found that the thyroid functions were also altered with high mean TSH values among the gas station attendants and high TPO antibody percentages among them, indicating an autoimmune thyroiditis condition. We, and we assess their uh, ultrasound scan, uh, their uh, thyroid uh, gland as well. And we uh, saw that uh, benign nodules were seen in two full handlers. Reproductive functions were also altered among them. And with the duration of employment, there was a uh, significantly more reporting of premature ejaculation. The Department of Biochemistry at the Faculty of Medicine spearheaded the uh, effort on identifying the metabolic derangements. And they analyzed the oxidative stress and with the um, KU Lewin, they, were, they did uh, epigenetic analysis as well. And there were significant uh, derangements in um, fuel handedness. I actually have an interest in assisting chromosomal damage on exposure to uh, volatile compounds and toxins and radiation. That is where I did my master's as well uh, in the biodosimetry laboratory at the Faculty of Medicine, University of California. So it was a co collective effort of the whole faculty uh, uh, where we present the research data today. So the genes or the, the chromosomes are affected as well. And we saw this because we took a blood sample, isolated the lymphocyte, cultured the lymphocytes and let them divide. And when they divided, the fragments of chromosome that did not get into one of these main nuclei would be visible as a small micronucleus. And if you have more micronuclei, that means there is more chromosomal damage. So we saw more chromosomal damage in the form of high frequency of micronuclei among gas station attendants compared to controls. And there were two micronuclei per binucleate cells, more significantly with higher silene exposures. So in uh, conclusion, we would like to uh, say that more needs to be done with education of the public and we need to address the fact that each one of us is contributing towards the uh, environmental pollution. Be it spray painting, be it your uh, perfumes and cosmetics, we are all contributing slightly day by day to the deterioration of the quality of air in our cities. And with more than 90% of the population in the world living in polluted cities, uh, the health would ultimately deteriorate across the globe. So I would like to acknowledge all the uh, owners of the fuel stations, all the participants who took part in the study, uh, the staff members of the Faculty of Medicine, University of California, of all the departments, but especially I would like to thank the University of California for funding our study when none of the national bodies wanted to invest in us. So this is homage to you for uh, believing in us and investing in our effort. And of course, our collaborators from Radbound and uh, Lewin, and of course, the committee of the uh, 30th anniversary celebrations. So as the human race, I think it is time for us to take a step. With the, the UN Climate Change Summit being held next week, in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. I think there is time for uh, all the world leaders to come together and all of us should make a voice, maybe using social media to push them towards a better direction. So the time is now, so you have to make a difference. So let us make better choices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya.
your lectures and eye opener. It shows the impact of uh, air pollution on our uh, health uh, system, especially main organs such as cardiovascular, respiratory, neuro, neuro uh, nervous system. So we will entertain some questions at the end, end of the symposium. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Dr. Manosich Ghosh. He's the senior lecturer and postdoctoral researcher in the Center for Environmental Health in KU Leuven, Belgium. He will be talking about the export, sorry, the export storm concept for you, uh, Dr. Manosich. Hello and good afternoon. I'm Manosich Ghosh and I'm from KU Leuven, Belgium. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this symposium. Uh, I'm, I'm, while it's been quite some time presenting from behind the computer, I'm still not comfortable, so please bear with me. And I hope I can do justice to the topic that I'll be presenting on today. Uh, and, and I'm happy to answer or, or answer your questions or discuss at the end of my presentation. I hope you can see my slides now. Um, I will be talking about exposome research uh, and, and what we are doing in, in KU Leuven with, with the research. Uh, so exposome is a concept that's, that's relatively um, new in a way that it has been popularized now, but it, it's, a, it's a concept that was coined by Professor uh, Christopher Wilde uh, in the year 2005 where he spoke about the totality of human environmental exposure from conception onwards and complementing the genome. The, the concept has, has evolved from there on with uh, advancement in technology as well. So over the past decades uh, in the recognition of the idea that health is implicated by, impacted by a multitude of factors, there has been a paradigm shift in the exposure disease concept so we've uh, now made a, a effort to move away from the one exposure, one disease concept to a bit more holistic uh, approach in, in understanding the totality of exposure through the exposome concept. And another major change has been in, in the one gene, one disease um, concept as well, where we've gone from a, a targeted approach to a bit more agnostic approach often a discovery-based approach towards understanding of disease, especially because uh, while it has been uh, quite well known that, um, that the, the phrase that genetic loads the gun, it, it's also true that environment pulls the trigger. And, and this has been rather uh, simplistically used thus far. And, and we, we want to understand a bit more in, in a holistic way, how, how these factors impl are implicated in, in a, uh, disease development. When we talk about exposome, there is uh, the personal exposome, which is uh, which is connected to an individual's behavior, so to say. That includes physical activity, work, uh, your exposure to toxic chemicals, your sleeping habits, smoking, for instance, and your social or uh, socioeconomic conditions as well. Then there is uh, the shared condition, uh, which which includes urban environment, air pollution, climate. Uh, noise that includes traffic in, in an ur urban condition, traffic noise, uh, as well as traffic pollution, uh, light, etc. And then there is the biological response part of it, which forms our internal exposome. This includes uh, the gut microbiome, uh, gene expression, so the genetics of it, uh, the, the, the expression through epigenetic mechanism, which we will come to later, uh, metabolomics, uh, and, and also stress and other factors such as aging related processes. Now, why are we so concerned about understanding the exposome? 20% um, or more of all deaths, and, and here I'm speaking about the European context of it, uh, is, is uh, related to environmental factors. And through understanding of exposome, we, we can have a better understanding of the causal pathways leading to common diseases. And when I talk about diseases, I'm specifically talking about non-communicable diseases here. Uh, this has led to the establishment of uh, the world's largest network of projects studying the impact of environmental exposure on human health, which is the European Human Exposome Network, which constitutes nine large-scale projects. 
uh, with partners from 24 countries and 126 research group. This uh, provides an opportunity for, for scientific innovation um, uh, in, in the questions framed a paradigm shift, as I mentioned, uh, and, and greater breadth of exposure assessment, uh, including agnostic approaches to generate new hypothesis, environmental wide association studies to permit analysis of mixtures, uh, co-occurrence interactions, et cetera, synergistic effects, uh, to explore the timing of exposure uh, to, to one's life course. And, and this will be achieved through nine projects, including Hedimed, Remedia, Longitudes, Athlete, Eximius, E4, Equalife, Expanse, and HE. Of these nine projects, two of us uh, primarily focus on occupational health and, and um, occupational exposure or exposome-related disease, which is the E4 project, which I will be talking uh, largely about, and also Eximius project. Now, the tools of um, the e assessment of exposome already to a, to a degree exists with us. We have uh, information, we have tools at our disposal, which are used classically in epidemiological studies, which includes questionnaires, uh, which includes a collection of large scale data on, on residential factors, occupational, smoking history, job exposures, etc. There are uh, newer advanced models, which, which are GIS-based models, which includes air pollution, green space, noise, et cetera. There's uh, wearable devices, which include smartphones, which, which also increases the amount of data inflow through this. And then there are, uh, of course, uh, high throughput multi-omics uh, studies, which includes epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, all the ones that we can think of. Other conventional biomarkers, which are used uh, as for assessment of biomarkers of exposure as well as effects, and our use of so so basically what it does is integrates all these information to come to a common common conclusion regarding our health and how how these exposures mediate um, mediated through the omics approaches lead to adverse health. This is a, a, a nice figure to show that uh, from, from this, uh, the, the journal here, which is indicated here. So we, we talk about the external exposure, of course, which includes exposure through air, water, dietary sources, soils, et cetera, mediated by microbiota, which, which then leads to the internal microbiome, internal micro exposome as well, which are then including inclusive of DNA methylation, microRNA, histone modifications, proteins, the ones that we can think of when we talk about epigenomics, there's transcriptomic changes, proteomic changes, metabolomic changes, all encompassed by with uh, genomic changes, which kind of kind of um, is, is indicative of our predisposition, if, if, if I might say so. Now in E4 project, what is E4 project? E4 project is a is one of the nine projects in the in the uh, human exposome network. It runs from the year 2020 and 2024. So we are somewhere in the second year of, of our project. And, and uh, we, we want to look at the contribution of a work-life exposome uh, towards disease development. Now, why are we interested in work-life exposome? Because occupational diseases in EU contribute uh, to 5 to 7% of the mortality with a financial burden of, of 2 to 6% of the GDP. There are, of course, several challenges like in any context of exposome research. Um, we have only limited information on, on the in totality of occupational exposure, and we often have um, single occupational exposure disease connection. We do not know about the vulnerability in this context. Biological mechanisms in, in a large number of cases are unknown. And then there are upcoming challenges, which includes the aging workforce, uh, female participation in, in the workforce, uh, changes in nature of work and, and, and the changes in exposure and exposome itself. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, exposome is a, is a more a continuous uh, thing, which happens throughout a lifetime. So these are the inherent challenges which exist. Now, working life is largely ne neglected in most of these, um, in, in, a, in a large number of projects when talking about exposome, and, and this will be primary focus of, of the E4 project. The challenges that I mentioned just now are characteristics of exposome and are 
inherently and, and also could be used as strength. Uh, the scale and complexity characterization of many categories, quite different types of exposure. Uh, they, they are, of course, dynamic, but it, it's something that's, that's incredibly important to understand. The exposome challenge, uh, it, it changes markedly over time, as I mentioned, and, and so possible, it, it might be possible in, in understanding the, the dynamic changes in exposome, we might even be able to understand the, pos the critical window in which there is the largest impact of, of such exposure, exposure scenarios. Um, the, there are technical challenges as well as data analysis challenges. And then in Exposome project, we therefore use a combined approach. Uh, the first approach is integration of large scale cohort data, which includes the combination of the, and, and a continuation of Omega net uh, mega cohort data, where we can have access to data of almost 20 million people, which is a huge number uh, and, and uh, probably one of the largest in, in this context. And so this, this will be done through large scale pooling of, of the data that we can get from the cohort. Uh, this includes, of course, existing data which have been collected through questionnaires and the tools that I mentioned before. This includes also omics measurements in some cases and, and the pooling of the data and further analysis of data might reveal some of the key questions that we have. Additionally, what we will do in IFAR project is two unique case studies, one focusing on respiratory health because that's one of our interests and, and uh, we will focus on asthma and, and COPD and, and also to a certain extent through data mining exercises and, and through exploration of mega cohort data focused on, on lung cancer uh, to, a, to a certain degree. And then we will also focus on focus of, uh, on shift work and, and I will come to this a bit later. Uh, this will involve collection of new data at an individual level uh, and additionally biomarker analysis. So what this combined effort uh, does is, is increases our understanding and power of analysis and, and uh, also, also provides much more deeper understanding into the biological pathways and markers of exposure and or disease. And uh, so, so, so what this in turn does is, is it impacts the overall um, policy changes in, in, in our understanding of, of health and, and the implementation thereof. And also, also it, it, re it probably will aid in reduction of economic burden uh, as a result of of diseases that are that are primarily caused by occupational exposure. Now, within the AFAR project, we are studying work-life exposome in relation to non-communicable diseases. But one of the integral part is is uh, is the biomarker assessment. Uh, this uh, is is and then to understand the biomarker of of exposure as well as of effect, we want to use the different omics technologies, but also exposure assessment tools at our disposal. And this can be done through sampling of, of biological material, which traditionally involves uh, uh, blood through uh, phlebotomy and, and then from there on isolated uh, samples like DNA samples or leukocytes or some other specific cell types. But often these techniques are invasive ex with the exception of saliva and urine, for instance. And this has become much more evident uh, with the COVID pandemic, where, where access to uh, personal sampling has been reduced. So we, we often have to think of alternative mechanism. And that's where we focused on self-sampling quite a lot. That includes uh, possible sampling of buccal samples, uh, possible sampling of uh, finger prick bloods, which I will come to later, and urine and saliva sample, which are traditionally collected as non-invasive matrices. Now to inf make this uh, decision, we, we relied on, on a combination of strategy in which we relied on a, a systematic review where we screened all the methods that are at our disposal, as well as through a pilot study, which we have set up. This systematic review allowed us to screen through methods that are existing and then to prioritize methods that have to be implemented or, or optimized or, or even uh, updated to a certain extent to fit to the exposure context. I will take you briefly through what we have done so far. Uh, in, in, in the search category, we had uh, for the self-sampling methods, uh, keywords which define non-invasive matrices 
and self sampling techniques uh, or or techniques that can be that exist but can be implemented in smaller volume of samples and then we focused on biomarkers of exposure which included metals polyaromatic hydrocarbons cotton and btex etc there were biomarkers of effects that we explored that included genomics epigenomics telomere length oxidative stress proteomics cytogenetics etc and then um, markers which are representative of both biomarkers of exposure and effect in, that included VOCs. Now, we also had set a strict criteria for the inclusion and exclusion thereof, uh, and, and we did not include animal studies or in vitro studies for, for, for this specific case. What we found out was quite interesting, as you would see here uh, on this, uh, we had the different matrices listed, and the possible analysis that could be either done in, in a low volume sample or through self sampling. Blood, of course, has been mostly explored in, in several contexts, but in, in the self sampling context or, or in small volume context, there were several parameters that could be studied, which is not surprising. And this was the case also for urine and saliva as well. So we had, uh, we now have a combination of methods with low volume blood sampling and urine and saliva sampling through which we can cover a lot of these methods uh, that are that are essential for our study. We also found out that breast milk could be a, an interesting matrix, even though it's, it's limited by the duration of, of when it can be collected and only specific for representative of one gender, it could, it could still be useful matrix for, for analysis in different study contexts. And thereafter, we have now designed a pilot study to focus on, on non-invasive or, or, or minimally invasive sampling procedures where we can use low volume sampling to analyze these markers. The methods, the primary objective of this is to optimize, uh, develop, of course, a certain methods which do not exist which includes say proteomics in, in Excel breath condensate. And when I say it does not exist, we mean uh, does not exist in the context of, of the expertise that is uh, present within the EFAR project. So we have to develop these methods, uh, cell-free DNA methylation, uh, for instance, and, and then also optimize the storage and collection procedures, which can be used in an occupational setting. Now, these alternative methods, uh, as I as I indicated before, we have two case studies in in, in EFAR project that will be applied in those two studies as well. Um, as you can see here in in EFAR study, the biological matrices that we plan to use are the minimally invasive sampling procedure, which you can see on the left hand side here. That includes saliva, which can be used for measurement of of uh, markers such as cortisol and melatonin. Uh, there is Excel breath, uh, which, which will be used. Uh, here you see a picture of Receiver Sampler, which is from our colleagues from Owlstone. They have uh, developed a method to, to analyze volatile organic compounds in Excel breath, which can be used as a marker of effect uh, and, and especially relevant in case of lung toxicology and, and lung health. We will analyze several omics markers in Excel breath condensate, of course, inflammatory markers as well. We will, in, in in, uh, along with this, we will of course do spirometry measurements to understand more about the lung health of the population. We will use urine for uh, biomonitoring as well as uh, clinical chemistry uh, and, and some other markers of, of such as cotinin. Um, and then we will use uh, invasive sampling and compare it with uh, another low volume sampling, which I will come to in the next slide with peripheral blood, whole blood uh, plasma serum, we will study several hallmarks of aging, including telomere length, immune health using a panel of cytokines, biomonitoring hormones. Uh, ex in the extracellular matrices, we will study the proteins and different omics, epigenomics and GWAS markers. So the pilot study essentially is, uh, is recruitment of participant, uh, which includes recruitment of 60 participants uh, healthy volunteers, uh, non-smoking, preferably in this context. And these volunteers would be recruited uh, and after signing the informed consent, they will be asked to provide uh, details through a long questionnaire, which includes non-variable uh, points, uh, such as uh, past history of illness, uh, socio-demographic conditions, including education, work, et cetera. 
And then they would have to fill in a continuous questionnaire, a short questionnaire, which is over a period of five days, which would be on, on factors which are variable of say, for instance, waking up time on, on, on these days, the diet they had, the, the amount of exercise they had, uh, and so on the screen times, et cetera, that could be the question that could be asked through these short-term questionnaires. Biological sample will be done on day one of the sampling and day five, uh, where we will collect, as I mentioned, Excel breath condensate, Excel breath volatile organic compounds, saliva, urine samples. And uh, in addition to uh, phlebotomy, uh, which is traditionally done, where, where we collect EDTA trace element tube serum, Pax gene tubes for different omics markers, we will also collect dried blood spots in filter cards, which uh, we then will compare between the traditional method and, and the filter card. This is used in, in different contexts in case of um, newborn children, for instance, but this is not so much uh, used in, in the occupational context and, and might provide useful when, we, when there are filled field collections or, or things used in that case. And they can be stored at room temperature. So that's, that's an added benefit here. And they, they, they can serve as useful source of DNA, which will be used in the study for comparison with the traditional matrices. Now, as I mentioned, will be used in two, two of the studies, including the, the work package where we focus on lung health, where we want to understand a uh, case study to investigate effect of working life exposure on respiratory health in general population. So we have a short-term study as well as a long-term study uh, where we want to understand uh, the biological pathways and earlier markers of disease, primarily here in this case, COPD and asthma. And we also have a study where we want to investigate the effect of shift work on, on health and, and um, changes in early markers, uh, which can be then connected to diseases, including breast cancer, for instance, or some other forms of cancer, which has been connected to shift work. The outcome of this project is, is expected to be through a toolbox. The toolbox is partially available where you can now find the protocols that I have just mentioned. We've created uh, standard operating protocols for biological sample collection. And these are already available through these toolboxes. And we would further refine these toolboxes to, to provide you a bit more uh, data on optimized forms of collection storage when we, when we are done with the pilot study. So this will serve as a communication tool for, for researchers, but also for policymakers. And, and it will inform different stakeholders uh, of our findings and, and we will communicate our research through that. As I'm talking about I'm, I'm at the end of the description of the EFAR project, I just wanted to quickly highlight you and bring your attention to Eximius project, which is another in, interesting project, which looks at uh, the overlap between markers, which are could be a result of exposure or could be a result of disease, as you can see here through this diagram. Uh, in one of the approaches, the first approach, we start from the from understanding of the exposome exposure we study biomarkers of exposure and, and we use general population and birth cohorts, uh, as well as occupational cohorts of, of park workers, uh, pain factory workers exposed to solvents, miners, metallurgy workers, waste handlers, and so on, to understand how exposome contributes to uh, the, the change in immune health, so to say. This The focus primarily here is immune changes. And then we take a, another approach where we start from the patients of, of uh, autoimmune diseases or immune mediated diseases rather, uh, including systemic sclerosis, systemic lupus, erythrom erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis. And what we do is we try to see which are the overlapping markers and can we predict, uh, connect exposome to disease? Because as I, as I mentioned in the beginning that um, exposome itself is, is quite a continuous uh, and, and dynamic uh, concept. So, so in, in a five-year project, it's, it's extremely difficult to analyze one's exposure or exposome from conception till, till even adult life or, or even work life. So what we do is we kind of combine the approach to meet somewhere in the middle to, to come to overlapping markers, which helps in, in building up uh, through different kinds of uh, omics tools, proteomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, and genomics. Uh, through data integration and uh, of both multi-omics and immunomics data and machine learning 
some integrated uh, and 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 through systems biology some uh, markers of of predictors of exposure as well as disease markers or or predictors of uh, predictors of disease and and possibly subtyping. While um, I, I I do personally uh, working within exposome research, I do see the immense promise it it holds. I also acknowledge the the immense amount of challenge there is, both in terms of technological advancement, as well as meaningful integration of these large scale data, which which uh, which again is is a is an enormous challenge in my opinion. And, and this is something that is being addressed through the European Human Exposome Network, where all the nine projects have come together and acknowledged this, that there is a, a, a difficulty with the data that's being generated and to make it shareable and findable for, for all other projects to collaborate. And this is an effort. And I think we will be uh, to a certain extent successful at the end of the duration of these, uh, these projects. Uh, with this promise, and, and I hope I can share more results in the future, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who are uh, involved in, in, the, in, in the EFAR project as well as in the Exposome projects at large. And uh, EFAR projects is led from TNO in the Netherlands, and, and this is our wonderful team uh, for the first meeting pre-COVID. Uh, Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to us and we are always willing to collaborate. Thank you so much once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Manoj, for your uh, very informative lecture and uh, sharing your uh, experience on the exposome concept. And we have little time for questions. If you have, if the audience or the those who are connecting with us through the online platform can post your questions now. Before starting, I have a one question for Professor Paul Sheepers. Now you have been talking about the relationship between air pollution and various respiratory diseases such as asthma. Do you have any evidence or information in relation to the uh, exposure to air pollution and COVID-19? Yes, thank you for this very interesting question. <clears throat> I've uh, reviewed uh, some papers for a special issue that was that has been published where we have actually tried to find out about um, associations, and there have been some, let's say, epi studies uh, relating vaccination uh, status to uh, uh, hospital admission. So definitely, there is, uh, let's say, by association in epi studies, there is uh, a hint, let's say, towards potential associations. Uh, I'm a bit, uh, let's say, uh, careful, you know, to uh, interpret. Uh, these associations, but definitely, of course, there is uh, the respiratory system is is a target for both. Uh, so, so there is definitely um, uh, interaction uh, to be expected. But uh, I think it's a bit too early now to make conclusions regarding the potential mechanisms involved or to su suggest a causal relationship. Thank you, Paul. Next question is to Tanya. It's about the fuel uh, station handlers. What protective measures can they take to prevent the, uh, these uh, uh, effects, uh, harmful effects of uh, air pollution? Thank you for the question, Madam. I think uh, it should be uh, touched upon. Uh, so actually NIOSH, uh, the National Institute of Occupational Safety was uh, collaborating with us. So we informed them of these measures as well. So one thing uh, would be to have protective gear. So they were getting skin dermal exposures, which peaked the uh, BTX exposure levels. So a dermal exposure should be prevented by, via PPE. And if possible, masks are also advised for particulate matter prevention of exposure through uh, combustion engines coming through their way all the time. The other thing would be to limit and curtail the amount of time that they spend during the uh, shift. Uh, 
So with prolonged exposures of eight hours or more, the BTX levels significantly increased. And the other thing is that like, uh, non-exposure amount of time should be long as well. So they should be on leave for a longer period of time for the body to recover and exhale all the exposures that they've accumulated thus far. Because uh, even at night, uh, even through metabolism and the, uh, the, the exposures uh, seem to be continuing in uh, uh, full handlers. The other thing was they shouldn't be housed in the same property uh, during the nighttime as well. So even even when they turned off the shift uh, among these fuel handlers, they used to be housed in a property right on top of the fuel uh, station or right next to it. So the exposures continue to happen in these people, even when they were not on shift. So that should be prevented as well. Do you expect to prepare a guideline or uh, something like that for fuel handlers in the future? Uh, actually, we've informed Niosh, as I said earlier, and individually we've uh, approached the full handlers and the full stations and informed them of the um, uh, findings that we've had. But I think uh, we should take a step forward and make guidelines on how to prevent uh, like health deteriorating in this very economically productive, very young male um, participants. Next question. It's about air pollution again. The major cities of the world, uh, most of the major cities are polluted. Uh, I, um, people Sometimes people wear masks in the cities. How much effect does it have wearing a mask? Professor Paul, would you like to take the question? Yeah, sure. Let's say that's an interesting question. Thank you for that. I think that's, a, that's one of the lessons that we've learned during the COVID period in Netherlands, where we try to assess, let's say, the effect of um, <clears throat> air pollution. And there are two sides, of course, let's say during lockdown, there was less traffic, but actually the results <clears throat> from that lockdown on the levels of air pollution were a bit, bit uh, I would say, disappointing. Let's say I would have expected higher impact of that. So let's say uh, we have to <clears throat> consider that pollution by itself travels over longer distance. Um, second, I think you're referring to the mask <clears throat> that is uh, worn by the public. I think we have to realize that the mask, let's say that the best quality of protection worn in the hospitals, that's the P P <clears throat> FP2, or an N95 quality um, uh, personal protective equipment, respirator also called. That's a very good uh, device where you can expect, let's say, also reduction of inhal inhalation of particulate matter. But if we are looking at, let's say, the, um, the type of mask that is not certified, uh, like the, what we usually call community mask, let's say that can be a woven or non-woven mask, let's say from textiles like cotton, or uh, uh, let's say also um, uh, polymers that have not been uh, uh, tested for uh, high efficiency. There, I, I think it, um, I have doubts. So I really think that specifically, I refer to the ultra-fine particles as the, let's say more toxic ones. I, I have doubts whether, the mask will actually much um, contribute. But I, I know that there are ongoing studies to, to test this, let's say in a uh, sort of uh, formal setting. So I'm of course looking forward to see to what extent maybe the respirator type, let's say the better quality mask could also, let's say be of value uh, um, to reduce the uh, health impact of, uh, of outer air pollution. Thank you, Paul. Next question is for Dr. Manosic. Uh, we have seen your wonderful research projects. Are they uh, confined to developed countries like in Europe? Or do you expect to extend these projects to our developing countries like our country, Sri Lanka? I'm asking because we can benefit a lot from your projects. Well, absolutely. I think uh, through at least through the Omega Net uh, effort, there has been integration of cohorts from different uh, countries as well. And it, it's always a welcome effort. So if you are interested, please, uh, we, can, we can provide you with the questionnaires. 
uh, which we use often. So that could be a, a way to harmonize the data collection as well. So that's something to keep in mind because often data collection is not harmonized and it's, it's therefore difficult to integrate. So if we want to uh, integrate other participants, it would be nice to have a harmonized protocol of data collection. And uh, in the Exposome project, there are non-European partners as well. So there are partners uh, through different cohorts, such as ECHRS, which is focusing on respiratory health, and it's part of the E4 project. Uh, there are partners from other countries. Uh, also, there are Australian partners and some other countries which are involved. So yeah, we are always open to discussion. Uh, there's, of course, a catch there that you don't have financial aid uh, because the projects are already prepared. But yeah, through, through collaboration, we can, I think, certainly find a way to, to integrate and, and inform decisions in other countries as well. We are very happy to collaborate with you in your research projects. So I think that is the end of that. There's no more questions. So that is the end of our, this symposium. The uh, certificates for Professor Paul Sheepers and Dr. Manosich, we will send them by post. Uh, now I would like, like to invite Tanya to get her certificate for the symposium.